Hopefully you've got a sermon outline and uh, we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, you know, scripture is clear on the principles which must be followed for a successful building project. And this morning I want us to consider Israel's first building project. Uh, it was called the, the Tabernacle, which is a, a was a very ornate tent that would serve as a dwelling place for God until the people entered the promised land and built their temple later. And so let's look this morning, we're going to see six keys for a successful building project. Key number one, it takes a clear plan. It takes a clear plan. Exodus 25 verses 1 through 9, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me from every man whose heart moves him. You shall raise my contribution. This is the contribution you are to raise from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat hair, ram skin, dyed red, porpoise skin, acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices for anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and setting stones for the ephod and for the breast piece, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them according to all that I'm going to show you, Moses, as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern for all the furniture, just so you shall construct it. Now, let me, let me give you five quick things from these verses. Uh, first, uh, understand that building programs are not a strange thing for the people of God. There was a building program, as we see here, for the tabernacle later, hundreds of years later, when they're in the land, there's a building program for the temple under King David. And uh, we'll be looking at that later in the series. The second thing is that God reveals the plan for the building. Moses listened, God spoke the plan. Construct a sanctuary for me according to the pattern of the tabernacle. God's the one who laid out the plan for this building, this, this tabernacle. The third thing is God reveals all the materials required for the building, exactly what was needed to complete the job. And there's all these materials. The fourth thing that you see from this passage is that God is going to use people to resource the building. And the fifth thing, this is really important, is that God is going to use willing people to resource his building project I think the big idea from those verses that I just read to you is for a successful project, you, you have to have a clear plan. And the Lord reveals to people a clear plan for the building. What, what follows, if you read chap, uh, Exodus chapters 25 through 31, are the details of the plan in great detail, measurements, materials, personnel, everything required for the completion of the tabernacle. And if, if you look carefully, you will see a plan for the building and also for the raising of the funds to resource this building. Folks, it took a clear plan. And the same could be said for us at Mariner's Church. Um, in order for us to have a successful home-free campaign, we must have a clear plan. And we have been planning uh, to make this move, to fulfill this dream for years. We have not only obtained the land where the building is going to be and paid for it, we've acquired, as we've mentioned, these two additional acres uh, with a home on it that's going to make our, our final home better. Uh, we've also developed a plan for the site development. We have gone to an architect. We have a plan for the building that we're going to build there. Uh, and today, we are presenting a plan for raising the funds to pay off all of our land and, and possessions so that we can be in a, a great position to take the next steps when the Lord tells us to go. But for now, we're, we're sort of in the position, if you know the Old Testament story of Joshua and the children in the final stages of taking possession of the land. And it's going to be an exciting journey for us over the next few weeks as we see this plan come to fruition, uh, we're convinced that as we walk with the Lord, he's going to direct our steps and make his plan clearer and clearer. Uh, he's spoken to us clearly that this series of five messages is a part of his plan for mariners, 
And we'll be considering, folks, one of the most important subjects in the Bible, and that is our money and what we do with it. And I'm going to encourage you not to miss any of these messages. I'm going to encourage you to also come on Wednesday nights here at 630 to have discussion groups to grapple with the principles that are going to be spoken on these Sundays. And, and, and this, this material can impact your life for, for time and eternity. And so we need a clear plan if we're going to have a successful project. There's a second key. Beyond a clear plan, it takes to have a successful project, it takes a grace perspective, a grace perspective. Exodus 35, verses 1 through 3. It says, Then Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. He's talking about all building the building and so forth. For six days, work may be done, but on the seventh day, you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death, and you shall not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Now, it's interesting, folks, right in the middle of this discussion of uh, this building program, uh, God, Moses brings up the idea of a Sabbath rest. And you say, well, what, what is the Sabbath here? It says in these verses, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. The, the concept of Sabbath is the idea of resting from work. Uh, when the Lord finished the creation of the world in how many days? Six days. It says that he rested on the seventh day. When your work is done, you rest. Now, listen to this in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. It says, So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest. Folks, there is a, a different kind of rest that we enter today on this side of the cross of Jesus Christ. What is the rest that we enter as Christians? Let me, let me explain it this way. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, he came to perform two great works. He came to establish and to eliminate. He came to establish a life that was absolutely perfect before his father. He lived his life in perfect obedience to the boundaries of God, of the Ten Commandments, of a life of perfect love and perfect obedience. And two times at, toward the end of his life, uh, the Lord, the Father said from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus lived a perfect life that was perfectly accepted by the Father. And then having established a perfect life, the second thing that Jesus came to do was to eliminate all of our sins and everything about you and me that is displeasing to God. He established the perfect life and then he took his own perfect life and allowed that perfect life to be nailed to a Roman cross in order to eliminate everything about us that is displeasing to God. And we've said it this way before, that first Jesus came to live the life we couldn't live, a perfect life, in order that he could die the death that we should have died. And that's what Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6 speaks of, what he did on the cross. It says, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Jesus. And by his scourging, we are healed. Listen to this. All of we like sheep, every single one of us, have gone astray. We've all sinned. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And at the cross, folks, Jesus finished the work, hear me, of making it possible for a sinful man to go to heaven. In one of his final statements hanging on the cross, do you remember what he said? It is finished. And here is the great truth of the New Testament. The work is finished. It is done. 
The cross finished it. Jesus has come and he's finished the work that made it possible for you and for me to be totally forgiven and totally accepted for the holy God of heaven. That work has been done. It is, it is finished. And when we believe in Jesus and bow our knee to Jesus, he gives us the grace of forgiveness and acceptance. He has already accomplished everything that you need to do to go to heaven, folks. That's it. It's done. And we should be resting in that fact every day. We should live our lives in the Sabbath rest of Jesus. We are in Jesus totally forgiven, totally accepted. That's the number one message that the voice of God wants to communicate this morning all the time, is that we are totally accepted and loved in Jesus Christ with unconditional love, forgiven, accepted. Now, why is it important that this word about the Sabbath is just plopped right in the middle of a discussion of a building program? It speaks of the motive that we have for this building. We are building, we will one day build this building from a position of rest. Whatever we do in the Christian life, we do from a position of rest. I am not in this home-free campaign, this building campaign, in order to be loved and accepted by God. I'm in this deal because I know I am loved already and accepted by God. And I want to do it because it will bring Him glory. I have been so showered, and if you are in Jesus Christ, we have been so showered with the grace and forgiveness and acceptance of Christ, and there is no more powerful motivator in the world than grace. My, my self-worth and value does not depend on how quickly this project gets done. I, 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 am, I am committed as the Israelites built from a position of rest they didn't fully understand the rest that we comprehend today on this side of the cross, but we do. And, and like them, we must be in this program with a clear plan and a grace perspective. Let me give you a third key to a successful building program. It takes a willing people. In verse Chap, uh, verse 4 of chapter 35 of Exodus says, Moses spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, this thing which the Lord commanded, saying, take from among you a contribution to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart. Let him bring, bring it as the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple and scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin, dyed red, porpoise skins, acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense and onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and for the breastplate piece. Let every skillful man among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded. Listen, folks, in order for there to be a successful building program, there must be a willing people. There must be people who are prepared to give willingly. Why, why would a person want to give that which was in his possession to building the building of a house for the Lord? I, I think that question is answered best in this way. The depth of a person's willingness to give will be in direct proportion to a man's understanding of of what he has been given and his rest in Jesus Christ. When, when, folks, when I truly understand what I have in Jesus and how he has delivered me from the bondage of sin, the guilt of sin, the power of sin, one day the presence of sin in heaven, when I understand that by God's gift of grace that cost me nothing and cost Jesus everything, I have forgiveness and eternal life, uh, that's, that's what motivates me to give and 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 folks can i say that i'm gonna just say this right now in this campaign um if if you are not willing to give or you don't really see that god wants you to give that you want to give that you if you can't give willingly don't give to this deal please it takes willing people a clear plan a grace perspective a willing people and here's key number four it takes an intentional preparation Exodus 35 verse 20 says, So all the people 
went to their tents to prepare their gifts, an intentional preparation. Evidently, after Moses gave the plan to the people for the building, uh, what it would look like, and also the plan for how it would, would be resourced, that they would be the ones to contribute and support for this project. Uh, evidently, after Moses told them what was specifically needed for the project, there was then a period of time when the people went back to their tents and prepared their gifts. Uh, we don't know how long that period of time was. It could have been just like this campaign that we're running, about a month. Uh, before Commitment Sunday, but I'm certain that when the people went back to their tents to prepare their gifts, they went back to listen to God. And I am sure that they reflected on the word of God that they had heard, they prayed, and each one listened for the voice of God in their life. And, and let me make an important comment here about those who feel led to take this journey with us, uh, this free the land journey with us. Can, can I just say this? Don't decide what you're going to give right now. Take time. Uh, you see, there, there's two ways that people give. People can give by reason or by revelation. There, there, there's two basic approaches. I can give based on reason uh, this means I look at what I have, I figure out what's reasonable, and commit to that amount. It takes no faith to give by reason. Reason asks, what can I afford? I can give also by revelation. That means I determine my gift by praying, saying, Lord, what do you want to give through me? And that requires faith. When you make it a matter of prayer, your, your decision becomes an act of worship. Revelation giving is asking God, how much do you want me to trust you for in giving this gift? And that's exactly what we're going to do over this month. We're going to spend time in intentional preparation for our gift, first and foremost, listening to God. And we will not listen in a vacuum. Uh, we're going to consider uh, sermons, you know, five sermons. Uh, we're going to have Wednesday nights to study and discuss with other believers what God is saying to you and what you're hearing him say. Times to pray. We're also going to have a come and see meeting on Sundays where you can go out and see this property that we believe the Lord wants to give to us. And then also uh, today uh, we are going to give everybody that's here uh, a book entitled The Treasure Principle. Uh, during this campaign, we want to encourage you to read this book. It's by Randy Alcorn. It's a new edition. It has a new chapter for those who've seen it before. Barb and I, when we were away in Florida, read this book cover to cover. It's 99 pages. And, and I dare you to read it and to not be changed by the truths and the principles of this book. We want to give it to you today back at the, at the resource table. So all of this is going to happen over the next month leading up to our Commitment Sunday in, on April the 5th. And my prayer over the next month is that we would prepare and allow God to work in our hearts a willingness to give exactly what he shows us to give to free, to free the land. Here's key number five. It takes a motivated procession. Exodus 35, 21. Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting and for all the service and all of its holy garments. Then all whose heart moved them, both men and women came, and they brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and bracelets, articles of gold. Uh, so did every man who presented an offering gold to the Lord. Every man who had in his possession blue, blue and purple scarlet material and so forth, goat's hair and ram skin and everyone who could make a contribution of silver and bronze brought it, the Lord's contribution. And every man who had in his possession acacia wood 
And all the skilled women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue, purple, and scarlet material and in fine linen. All the women whose hearts stirred with a skill spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought stones for setting in the ephods and oil and so forth. Now look at that bold statement. It says the Israelites, all the men and women whose hearts moved them to bring material for all the work which the Lord had commanded through Moses to be done, they came and brought a free will offering. Evidently, after the time had passed, the people had sought the Lord as to what their gift would be, and there was a call out in the camp. Maybe it was a trumpet. When you hear the trumpet, come. And the people started coming in a procession. And it was a motivated procession. These people were motivated in their hearts to come. It, took, it, it was a plentiful pr- procession. It took a lot of people bringing a lot of stuff to build this tabernacle. And they brought what they had. Those who had jewels and jewelry brought that. Those who had gold, silver, those who had cloth uh, that was needed brought that. Folks, did you realize that, that it would be highly likely that if we were to take all the jewelry that we possess among us that hasn't been worn maybe in a year, and all the cars that we haven't driven in a year, all the boats that we haven't driven in a year, the motorcycles, the trip that we did not take because of whatever, this virus going around and did a staycation instead of a vacation, if all that money was lumped together, there would, we would probably have enough money to, to pay off the land, to, fr- to free the land right now. If, if every one of us followed the principle of the tithe and simply gave a tenth off the top of what we possess as God commands, we would be very close to some huge victories. And it's those kind of decisions that the children of Israel were making. On Sunday, April 5th, we're going to have a procession here. We're going to ask those who are willing to come and give to free, to the, free the land. We're asking you to, to come and bring a first fruits offering a a cash offering on that Sunday, and then to consider what you might give over two years as a pledge. And the addition of the first fruits offering in the pledge would be the sum total of your free the land gift. And I'm just going to say a word to parents. Uh, If you're a parent, get your children involved in this over these next several weeks. Lord, to to pray and to become a part, to to have them earn money to give, to pray together as a family what your gift might be. What's it going to take for us to have a successful building campaign? Very same thing it took for the people of Israel. It took uh, a clear plan, a grace perspective, a willing people, intentional preparation, and a motivated procession. And there's one more thing. Key number six, it takes overcoming power. Overcoming power. You know, it took power for the Israelites to overcome the obstacles to giving. It wasn't just go go and bring your stuff, one, two, three, done. There were two main obstacles to their giving and releasing to the Lord what they had to build the tabernacle. And what were those obstacles that they had to overcome? Folks, listen to me. They're the same obstacles that we have to overcome to give what we have. Obstacle number one is this. If I give, I'll be giving up what's rightfully mine. Obstacle number two, if I give, I'll not have enough. You know, several years ago, uh, we discussed this passage in Exodus uh, prior to another campaign. And I remember our executive pastor, Dick Fry, Dick's with us, I saw him somewhere back there, uh, had some keen insights on this passage. And I asked him to put them down on paper and send them in an email to me, which he did, and I've kept it over the years. And let me read to you what Dick wrote. He said, Dear Bill, as you asked, here are a few thoughts to the Exodus passage. Because we don't spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, not everyone will be familiar with this passage of the people bringing their gifts to the Lord for the tabernacle. After hundreds of years as slaves in Egypt, the Israelites had absolutely nothing of their own to take from their slavery in Egypt. But God in his great provision 
made the Egyptians favorably disposed to give to the Israelites whatever they asked for when they left Egypt. Of course, God had already prompted Moses to be specific in what they would need to build the tabernacle. And so the Israelites, he writes, plundered the Egyptians and then they skedaddled out of town. Here's the kicker. Each of the families had some of these treasures that they had picked up in Egypt. They packed them in their bags. They headed to the promised land. And by the time we get to chapter 25, Exodus 25, lots of time has passed wandering around in the desert. Each of these families had time to grow fond of what God had provided and looked at these items as if they were owed them for their hard labor in Egypt. Does this sound a little familiar to today? God provides us a job and we earn a living and we start to grow fond of the spoils He's the one that gives us the ability, and yet we begin to believe that everything we have belongs to us. It's mine, mine. Then in chapter 25, Dick writes, the home free campaign starts with the Lord telling Moses exactly what was needed for the tabernacle. And the best verse, Exodus 25, verse 2, said, Moses, you are to receive the offering for me, the Lord, from each man whose heart prompts him to give. We don't know if everyone gave, or just some gave. But we do know that they gave way more than enough. Can you imagine how those Israelites might have felt looking back over all the years and seeing that your family had given to God's first earthly home? Wow! On the other hand, can you imagine discovering that your family was a part of the group that because of fear decided not to give because business was bad, the goat herd was suffering, the sandal business had really fallen off because none of their sandals wore out, remember that? <laughs> so you better hang on to the few things that you have left. Well, Bill, Dick writes, you get my drift. God has always provided, as he prompts the hearts of those at Mariners, we too will have the privilege of looking back and saying that we played a part in furthering the kingdom of God at Mariners in his grip, Dick. So, so Dick addresses the two main fears to giving. What, what I have is mine, and if, if uh, I give, I, I won't have enough. Where, where do you get the power, folks, to overcome the fear of giving? There's only one source of power that overcomes obstacles to giving. We're, we're called to uh, overcome sin and Satan and temptation and the world and certainly we're called to overcome the fear of giving because the Lord's called us to become like Jesus and he was a giver he is a giver what is the key to o overcoming in the Christian life look at first John chapter 5 verses 3 through 5 great verses here's what John writes for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome when you understand grace. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Folks, the key to overcoming is faith. And let me tell you what faith is. It is, a, it is the sixth sense that man has. Faith is the internal eye and ear of the spirit. Faith is spiritual sight and spiritual sound. Faith listens and hears the voice of God. The only thing that will enable you to overcome the fear of giving is faith in Jesus Christ. Seeing Jesus for who he is. Seeing what he has really done. And let me tell you what he has done. He has made you fabulously rich. In 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 the scripture says, for you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich in heaven, yet for your sake he became poor. He came to this earth, became a man, died on a cross, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Some are afraid to give because they're afraid. Won't have enough to pay the bills. Won't have enough for retirement. Won't have enough to go here, go there. Won't have enough to do this, do that. Listen, folks. When you have Jesus, Jesus alone, you have enough. 
Romans 8 verse 32 says, He, God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give you all things, everything you need? My God, Philippians 4, 19, shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in the gift of Christ Jesus. Somehow, some way, the children of Israel had everything they needed to be successful in this tabernacle building project. They had a clear plan. They had a grace perspective. They were willing people. They made intentional preparation. They had a motivated procession. And these people somehow, some way, had overcoming power. They had faith. And I want you to see what happened with these people. This is exciting. Exodus 36, verses 1 through 7. It says, Now, Bezalel and Aholiab and every skillful person in whom the Lord has put skill and understanding to know how to perform all the work in the construction of the sanctuary shall perform in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. They're going to build according to the plan. Then Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every skillful person in whom the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him to come to the work and perform it. The construction has begun. They have broken ground. And then it says they received from Moses all the contributions which the sons of Israel had brought to perform the work and the construction of the sanctuary. And then it says, and the people, they still continued bringing free will offerings every morning. And now watch this, watch what happens. And all the skillful men who were performing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from his work, they, they took a work break, and, and, and they, they came, uh, the work they were performing, and they said to Moses, Moses, the people are bringing much more than enough for the construction of the work that the Lord has commanded us to perform. So Moses issued a command and a proclamation was circulated throughout the camp saying, let no man or woman any longer perform any work for the contributions of the sanctuary. Look at this. It says, thus the people were restrained. They were held back from giving any, and bringing any more for the material they had was sufficient and more than enough for all the work to perform it. So guys, the whole point of the Home Free, Free the Land campaign is that we will reach such a day as this. And who knows when we're going to reach it? Maybe very soon, maybe years from now, where we reach the place where we say at Mariner's Church, you don't have to give any more to Home Free because we have more than enough to finish. It's done. Let's take all of our resources that we were spending here on lease payments and let's go love the community and love this world and lead people to Jesus. Now the challenge for all of us over the next month is to grow spiritually, to become more like Jesus and Jesus at his heart is a giver. The Lord wants us to grow in giving and that growth will will be the cause, I believe, of amazing joy in this place. It's put this way in 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Paul said, just as you excel in everything, Corinthians, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you excel in this grace of giving. Get better and better at giving. You, you believe you can grow in giving? You can. Maturity is measured, folks, by generosity. And so to experience this growth, I want to challenge you to make three commitments. Write these down. Three words. Come, commitment number one. Read, commitment number two. And pray, commitment number three. Commitment number one, I'm going to challenge you to come to every Free the Land event. Come every Sunday to, to hear the sermon, every Wednesday night discussion group, and to one of the Sunday Come and See events on Sunday morning after church, after church. Come to every Free the Land event. Make a commitment to do that. Number two, read. Read the Word of God every day. Amen? But also read this book. This is an incredible book. Uh, read the treasure principle. I, I dare you to read it and not be impacted by it. And the third thing is pray. I, I, I challenge you to pray. Pray daily that our church would experience accelerated growth in Christ's likeness. Pray that you would grow. Pray that God would show you what he wants you to give 
to the Free the Land campaign and pray by God's grace and mercy and what would be a miracle that, that, that we free the land of all the debt. You say, Bill, why, are, why, sh- why do we make these commitments? I'll, I'll tell you why we make these kind of commitments. I, we, because we have been given so much in Jesus. Pray with me, would you? Father, thank you. Thank you for the amazing grace of the Lord Jesus and for the finished work on the cross. Thank you that we don't have to do anything that we are forgiven and loved and accepted, that we have power, uh, freedom from the, the penalty of sin, the power of sin one day, the presence of sin because Jesus finished the work. Thank you that we can rest from our work and enter into his, that we can start every day totally accepted in you. And Lord, I want to pray if there's someone here today who's never entered that rest, that they would repent of their works and enter into your finished work. And Lord, I want to thank you for this great opportunity that we're going to have over the next month to become more like you, Lord Jesus, in the area of giving. And I'm asking, Lord, that you would grow our faith in you, our vision of you. Grant us to overcome the fear of giving and enter into the joy and blessing of it. And Lord, as a byproduct of our growing faith, we pray that one day soon you would free the land. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.